All right. I hope everybody can uh, hear me okay. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, strength training kind of in general and, uh, and for uh, track, and, track and field specifically. Um, and, yeah, if you have any, any questions, I'll uh, keep an eye on the uh, chat function here and I'll I'll answer them uh, as they come as well. All right, so we'll get started here. <clears throat> so I, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I've been uh, coaching kind of at uh, Dalhousie University for the past uh, few years in the uh, the jumping events. I'm also the uh, um, jumps and combined events coach for the next Canada Games cycle. And professionally, I work at the uh, Canadian Atlantic Sports Center, employed as a strength and uh, conditioning coach. So this is kind of the, uh, the area where I spend most of my day in. So we'll get rolling, rolling here. So the first thing I want to talk about is just some, uh, just some important definitions and uh, things that a little bit of take you back to physics class a little bit, just some things that you know, define them just so you guys know what they are as we go along here. So the first thing is maximum strength. So the ability to apply a large amount of force essentially. So that's kilogram, kilograms, pounds moved in a single maximal effort. So an example of that would be like a one repetition max back squat. So it's the uh, largest load you can move maximally for one all out sort of effort. Then we have power which is the ability to apply force quickly through a range of motion. So that would be throwing. So an example would be like an overhead shot throw, standing broad jump. So those are activities that really kind of encapsulate the expression of power. And power is basically in all track and field events, that's kind of the number one thing we're focused on, on as far as like increasing from a physiological standpoint. When we talk about performance and enhancing performance, power is usually the thing that we're kind of targeting. That's that key key sort of quality. And the other, other end of the spectrum, you have explosiveness, so rate of force development. So how fast can you develop force? So that would be something like a 20 meter sprint is an example of you know how explosive someone is, how fast they can develop force. They're only on the ground for a short period of time, so they have to apply force relatively quickly, and they can't apply maximal force because they're only down there for you know two uh, Two tenths of a second max. So if we look over at the right there, we just have a couple simple equations. I'm sure you've seen it. You've seen at some point in your uh, in your life. So we have power, force times distance divided by time. So like again, power is that that quality that we're always trying to increase when we talk about strength training for especially for track and field. So you can see the force the force quality. Well, that that kind of relates back to that maximal strength ability. So there we're just talking about just the ability to apply force, which is just mass times acceleration. So if we can increase our ability to apply force, so basically just get stronger, well, ultimately that can influence you know, how much power we can produce. Then the other end, we've got in the power equation, we've got distance divided by time. So in track and field, time is often one of the main constraints that we're working with. So when you're throwing, when you're jumping, when you're hurtling, all that sort of stuff, you have a limited amount of time to apply force. Um, so that's where that explosiveness and rate of force development gets involved. So, you know, your ability to develop force quickly can also influence power. So when we, when we think about strength training, we kind of, always have to be can you know considering how it kind of relates to that you know variable that we're trying to improve the most which is power so you, you kind of have like a spectrum of kind of things where we kind of look at with, with the weight training so we've got kind of ballistic movements you know fast movements that are really focused on applying force in those short periods of time to enhance power in that sense and then we've got other movements like that are a lot slower but you're moving a lot more mass and load that are there to influence you know, the total amount of force that you can pr produce. So we can kind of affect power in different ways with, with different types of exercises that you kind of emphasize 
and at different times of the year and with different types of athletes and in different event groups. All right, so these, here we go. So these would be some, uh, sorry for flipping around there. Uh, th these would be some like expressions of that explosiveness, so that rate of force development in track and field. So these are actions that, you know, they probably fall more on the explosive side of, of power quality. So that's things like, you know, touchdown and hurdles, takeoff and high jump contact in like the first 20 meters of a sprint, triple jump, things like that, where you're only on the ground for a short period of time. So you're really going to be limited by how fast you can develop force. And on the other side of the spectrum, there's kind of strength dominant movement. So movements where you know, you're on the ground or you're applying force for a little bit longer of a period of time. So those strength qualities become a little bit more important in developing that you know, maximal strength ability or that ability to apply force is going to enhance those movements to a certain degree, depending on the athlete. So that would be something like block clearance in the sprint start, where you're actually applying force to the blocks for a relatively long period of time relative to the you know, next steps in the sprint as you get faster, your ground contact time starts to decrease. Or even in something like steeplechase, as you come off the barrier, your ability to you know, overcome your own body's inertia as you come off the barrier and get out of that position. Well, that takes a certain amount of uh, strength as well. And then in the throws, obviously, more than any other discipline in track and field, you know, strength expression is going to be, you know, a very important aspect to, to the training. <clears throat> and then also in endurance events. So a lot of people think that you know, endurance events, you don't really need a ton of strength. And part of that is if you just, you know, if you look at endurance athletes, they're typically quite lean and not, you know, exceptionally muscled. So we don't necessarily think of them as needing a whole ton of strength. But that's that's our intuition talking. But if you look at the, the research that's out there on this, there's actually quite, quite substantial evidence that uh, strength training actually can enhance, enhance, uh, running running performance even over long distances up to you know five ten kilometers so first up there was just a, a review on uh, resistance training for elite endurance endurance runners and what they found was that the inclusion of loaded and unloaded explosive movements so these would be like jumping movements uh, you know Olympic lifting jump squats things like that really focusing on that rate of force development, explosive side of things, improved running economy by three to eight percent, depending on the studies review. So there was like five or six studies that, that met their inclusion criteria. Um, running economy being oxygen used at a given speed. So those athletes that did that explosive training actually used less oxygen to run the same, the same uh, speed. So they're basically more efficient. And then down at the bottom there, just a little explanation on again running economy. So if you're if you're a distance athlete, you, you're going to kind of you kind of have three ways you can improve your performance. So your maximal oxygen uptake improves, your ability to sustain maximal oxygen uptake improves. So that's kind of your your bioenergetics, your energy system. So working on that, which distance coaches are very good at, and obviously that's the main sort of focus of training, but also the ability to move efficiently. So basically decrease the cost of running is what we're talking about with the running economy. And you can look at a number of things there. I mean, body composition's a big thing there. Obviously, distance runners are pretty lean for a reason. Posture and mobility are other aspects that, again, you know, coaches will talk a lot about posture and that sort of thing. But also the force application at foot strike is kind of the thing that uh, they've shown that these you know, the inclusion of kind of strength training with loaded, unloaded explosive movements affects very, very positively and it can ultimately make you a more efficient, efficient runner. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, building kind of the base. So before you even think about you know, implementing any sort of like structured strength training program, no matter how old your athlete is or how much experience they have. There's a few things that you generally want to look at just from a safety standpoint and to ensure that 
you know, they can perform all the movements you're asking them to do correctly. So we kind of have a bit of a, a pyramid here that's kind of got four different tiers. So we're just going to kind of go up it and kind of analyze each tier and just kind of take a, take a look at it. So the first tier is kind of mobility. And you'll notice that's at the bottom of the pyramid. And that's because for you to basically strength train properly, you need to have extremely high levels of mobility. Not to say that you don't need high levels of mobility in you know, the track and field events, but in the gym, it becomes extremely important because eventually these athletes are going to be you know, negotiating pretty heavy weights and pretty high loads as they get more experience. Um, and if they don't have the mobility, they're going to create compensations within their body and end up having basically poor stability. So dramatically increases their their risk for injury so mobility is kind of that key quality that needs to be there before they start anything else an example i always like to give is if you look at the toddler they can squat all the way to the floor with their heels flat in a nice upright position and they can stay in that position and do things for several hours where if you look at the the fellow right beside him he's squatting all the way down but he's got to lift his heels up off the ground because he's actually lost quite a bit of ankle flexibility. So you see that a lot with us young athletes, like somewhere between the ages of five or six to 12 or 13, there starts to be a marked loss in mobility, whether that's due to, you know, just poor lifestyle habits or like wearing, wearing things like shoes all the time that have a high heel lift can affect ankle flexibility, you know, like a sedentary lifestyle can possibly affect flexibility. There's a number of factors, factors involved there. So if that mobility gets compromised and there's not an intervention to fix it, you ultimately should not really progress onto the, the next few things. So when you're looking at your, your young athletes, they're kind of kind of bantam, bantam age. You want to really ensure that you focus on that mobility, make sure they can actually have the range of motion to move properly before you ask them to do complex movements. So always include mobility like in your practice. It's, it really is if you, don't, uh, if you don't use it, you lose it sort of thing. You always have to reinforce that all the time. The next thing is stability. So a lot of common issues you see here, especially with younger developing athletes, is especially the girls' hypermobility. Guys might have some muscle imbalances, poor static posture. Again, a lot of that's due to you know, poor lifestyle, sedentary, sedentary behavior at a young age. So that's something that you really want to look at after mobility. So if they're, they've got mobility, are they able to stabilize their joints properly in the reflexive manner? So something that you know you see a lot is, is that uh, knee, down there you can see a, a girl with her knees kind of collapsed in. So that's not a flexibility issue, but she definitely you know has a bit of a stability issue there. She squats down, her knees tend to kind of fall together. So she doesn't have that basic sort of stability pattern to squat down because she lacks some sort of stability at, at her hips or the guy to her right who's trying to perform a simple push-up. Even before he goes down, his back is going to an, an extreme lordosis and tons of hyperextension. So he has a poor ability to stabilize his spine. So there's just simple things like that that you know, they're not really complex movements or anything. It's just the body doesn't reflexively stabilize properly for whatever reason. So that kind of has to be looked at before you go on to, you know, developing more complex, you know, loaded sort of sort of movements because it really is the essence of torque development. You have to stabilize the spine in order to produce lots of torque at the hip. If you can't do that, then you're going to have a lot of trouble later on as you try to do you know more more complex movements so athletes should be exposed to a broad range of stability patterns in order for the nervous system to understand how to stabilize joints and body segments and for anybody that's kind of read through the long-term athlete development stuff that's essentially you know the a similar sort of thinking over there as well so the next piece is uh movement so assuming that the athlete you know so yeah, an example of a stability pattern would be, uh, you know, can an athlete squat down all the way to the floor without their knees caving in or without their, uh, 
without kind of like falling backwards or something like that, or they have some loss of what I call like motor motor control, or can they do a push up? And as they push up off the ground, can, does their whole body kind of rise at once, or is, is their back sort of like sagging? So basic sort of posture is what we're kind of talking about when we look at uh, when we look at stability. So you can think of it as kind of like postural postural strength more than anything else. Um, does that answer your question, James? Great. Um, and then once you have those sort of basic, you know, the mobility is good. They've got full normal range of motion with their joints. The stability is great. Their knees aren't slapping together like they're, they're able to you know, stabilize the segments of the body that need to be stabilized. Then you can move on to, you know, movement. So developing kind of the movement patterns that eventually you're going to want to load up and actually develop things like strength, power, and explosiveness. So that's going to be, you know, basically dumbbell based, medicine belt, medicine ball based body body weight type exercises. So you're challenging their posture with kind of an external external load. So their nervous system is going to have to really work to stabilize the segments that need to be stabilized in order to produce torque to complete the movements in a highly effective manner. So with this with this sort of stuff you want to focus, you know, more on technique than than physiological adaption. So it's just about you know, doing a large variety of these type of movement patterns and reinforcing kind of correct technique. And this just builds that kind of just general weight room sort of skills and experience that they, no matter what your your training age is in the sport, if you don't have like this, if you haven't gone through sort of this piece of just kind of familiarization with all the basic kind of movement patterns you see in the gym, like a squat, a deadlift, a, a row, a pulling action, a a pushing action, a carrying action, then you can't really progress any further than that. So the, every athlete kind of needs to go through to this phase of developing that movement competency with all the kind of major major lifts in an unloaded manner. Now, once you're done that, you're ready to you're ready to start training essentially. So then you can talk about you know increasing strength, increasing power, you know, lifting more weight, doing more sort of uh, concentrated kind of loading with barbells that sort of thing so what you're basically trying to avoid is athletes that you know don't have the base to continue on developing so this is just a couple examples kind of following that that pyramid sort of uh, um, pyramid style thing is uh, so if you have you know, athletes can be overpowered. So say they have like a super high capacity to, uh, you know, produce powerful movements and they look extremely strong, but then they have an extremely limited base of mobility. And because of that, they also have limited stability. Well, then that's the kind of athlete that you'll see that'll tend to get injured and banged up a lot because they, they are extremely gifted as far as their basic athletic qualities and they're at a high level but they can't move through a normal range of motions. So they're giving up a lot and have to compensate a lot while they're doing these explosive movements. So it's like a car that's got like a, or like a golf cart that's got like a thousand horsepower engine in it that the chassis just explodes. So it can't, it can't kind of maintain the, the energy. Um, uncoordinated, the uncoordinated pyramid. So you'd see athletes that, you know, they have lots of mobility so this would be kind of your, your younger girls. So they're extremely mobile. They're, they're, in most cases, hypermobile, and they lack stability. So they have to do a lot of just basic sort of general strength work, nothing too fancy, just to ensure that they can stabilize their body properly because they actually have super maximal range of motion. So it would be, you know, an error to kind of skip that phase and move on to, you know, developing more complex things like strength with like heavy loaded movements um, before you've actually like made sure that they can stabilize their body effectively. And then what you have after that is kind of the, the athlete that you hope you get out of the kind of that developmental period between like 11, 15, 11, 16 is just the underpowered athlete. So they're mobile, they're stable, they move pretty well, but they just haven't developed that strength and power capacity, which means you know they're basically in a perfect place at that point to get in the gym and start, uh, you know, doing some uh, serious sort of strength training. So the next thing we're going to go over is uh, just kind of the basics of uh, 
of strength training. We're going to touch on a number of things. It's a very, very broad topic, and it also, you know, every single event has a different sort of strength training paradigm that's going to work best for it. So if you have any specific questions, if you're about the athletes, the events that you coach, feel free to uh, to ask them. That'll be a lot a lot easier because this is going to be pretty pretty general for the most part. So just going over general guidelines. So this is kind of uh, based off the uh, kind of the LTAD for those of you who've seen that. Um, Basically, you want, to, you want to start introducing some sort of strength training at kind of the stage four, so females age 11 to 15, males age 12 to 16. Um, the focus should really be on the things that we talked about earlier, so the general and postural strength. So that's kind of your stability and movement kind of areas of that, uh, of that pyramid. So you want to make sure, you know, they can negotiate, you know, body weight exercises, you know, very easily in a coordinated manner. You know, they're, they're doing dumbbell-based, med ball-based exercises, developing competency in that. You're not really focused on adding a ton of load at this point. You're just focused on exposing them to a variety of different movement patterns and, and loading patterns. Um, typically done in like a circuit-type based, based fashion. And frequency, you know, only, only about once to twice a week. So you don't really want to, you know, give them too much of this stuff too, too early. Then after that, once the once the athletes kind of matured a little bit, they've hopefully gone through puberty, right? They're ready to uh, hormonally ready to start doing some uh, more serious type of strength training and have the capacity to adapt to it. Then it's appropriate to start introducing some more advanced methods where you're more focused on developing that top tier of the pyramid, that capacity, so their strength capacity, increasing how much they can lift, increasing how fast they can lift things, things like that. So you know, starting with a frequency of two to three times per week. Um, and again, you're looking at large external loads with lots more recovery. So you're kind of moving away from that kind of circuit-based style of training. And you're adding you're adding loads by using you know, barbell lifts, Olympic lifts, instead of uh, dumbbells and kind of medicine balls and that sort of thing. Also, a lot more technically complex as well. So at this stage, you know, it really requires a good understanding of how to coach those movements properly as well because just like coaching any skill in track and field coaching movements in the gym also takes a lot of uh, knowledge as well so you want to make sure at this point that you're you know comfortable coaching the exercises that you're, you're asking your athletes to do and then once you get out of that phase um, so looking more towards your athletes that are entering into university or entering into their last year or two of high school then you want to continue into more advanced, more adva basically more advanced loading parameters. So I mean the movements at that point, the athlete has developed competency in a lot of those you know, big barbell type lifts, like squats, you know, deadlifts, Olympic lifting, um, bench press, things like that, depending on your uh, depending what event you're training for. And at this point, you want to you know you want to load them up a little bit more. So as athletes kind of increase in competency, they're going to need more of a stimulus to get a uh, continued adaption. So that's where periodization kind of starts to come into play and you've got to plan things in a certain manner so that your athlete is continually challenged by what you're you're throwing at them. So at that point, I mean, maybe your training frequency goes up, up a little bit just to make sure that the athlete is still being challenged and uh, you know, the loading becomes more concentrated and it's looking at improving more specific sort of power and strength kind of areas. And types of exercises, like I said, didn't, doesn't really change. Barbell lifts, Olympic lifts, and then you know some specific strength exercises might be you know implemented at that point as well. So that would be things like, and I kind of toss this in with strength training would be like uh, doing like weighted sled sprints, that type of stuff would be like a specific strength exercise for uh, sprinting. Throwing like a overweighted shot put would be like a specific strength exercise for shot put. Things things like that. Postural and uh, general strength. So that's that first first sort of tier that we had uh, kind of discussed. So th I imagine this probably applies to most of you listening. So this is for you know those athletes that they're just starting to kind of get into that maybe training sort of year round 
sort of sort of modes. They're doing kind of indoor track and field, ages kind of 11 to 16. So for that type of stuff, you know, what the sessions would actually look like, you know, they should they should be 20 to 45 minutes. So you shouldn't take you any longer than that to do what you, you need to do. And four to six exercises doesn't have to be, you know, a whole whole long list of stuff. Just, you know, very, again, depending on your event, you might be focusing more on the upper body. You might be focusing more on just general sort of postural strength, or you might be focusing more on the lower body or the hips specifically. So generally, you know, like circuit, circuit style training is very appropriate at this point. Recovery time, it doesn't take a ton of time to recover between these sessions, like 24 hours should be sufficient. But like I said, the frequency, you're not looking to jack up too much here one to two times a week. Um, you're just looking to build, again, those gen those very general qualities of stability and kind of movement competency. So there's an example right beside that of like, a, it's not a circuit, but it's a very basic, very basic uh, resistance training um, program for, but would be appropriate, you know, for athletes that are kind of in, intermediate as far as experience with strength training. So things like goblet squats, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's just a squat holding a, a dumbbell out in front of you. So very light load, like 20 to 25 pounds, weighted push up, push up with like a like a weight plate on your back, like 10, 15 pounds. Goblet dumbbell split squats, just a split squat holding a dumbbell out in front of you. TRX row, single left dead, deadlift, deadlift to box, prone single leg hip thrust. These are all exercises that, you know, they either have a small external load or they're uh, done just with body weight. Um, so again, you're not really looking too much at loading at this point. You're just looking at improving that sort of movement competency. And then once you've kind of passed that stage, you know, again, you're getting into more trying to develop that capacity, then things get a lot more complicated. So this is basically your basic uh, rep range chart and adaption chart. So I'm sure you guys have seen something similar to this and heard of these terms sort of tossed around. So the chart basically just shows you, you know, what sort of rep ranges in the, in the weight room kind of get you certain adaptions. So kind of the yellow bars kind of indicate the uh, rep range where that adaptation is going to be um, is going to occur. So with strength training, generally it's six or less reps. You know, six reps being done like to an extremely high intensity, so max maximal effort, six reps. Um, power training, low reps as well. Except again, you're not so much focused on power with uh, how much weight you're lifting. It's more about how fast you're lifting it, so it's more velocity focused with power and explosive training, whereas maximal strength, strength training is more how much weight you can lift. Um, and then hypertrophy, which for track and field, we don't spend a lot of time worrying about that one. Maybe if they're throwing, it's a bit more important, but essentially the larger your muscles are, the more force they're going to produce, but that comes with a trade-off of getting heavier. So most track and field events um, relative strength is kind of the main thing you're trying to develop. So you kind of have relative and absolute strength. Relative is how much you can lift, basically divided by your body weight. So if you have two athletes and one weight lifting the same amount of weight and one lifts, and, sorry, two athletes that are um, lifting the same amount of weight, but one weighs 200 pounds, one weighs 180 pounds. Well, the one that weighs 180 pounds is going to have a higher level of relative strength. They're going to be probably a more explosive, more powerful athlete when it comes to running and jumping exercises. For throwing, though, it doesn't really matter because you're not you're throwing an implement. So when you're not trying to project your body and you're trying to project an implement, then relative strength isn't quite as important and then absolute strength's more important. So that's why hypertrophy is something maybe you look at in throws, but in jumps, sprints, hurdling, distance running, that sort of stuff, not really something you necessarily need to focus on. But you can see hypertrophy is more in that kind of higher rep range. And what you're concerned about there is more just generating fatigue 
and uh, you know high time under tension. So how much time you spend per set lifting. So that if you imagine like bodybuilding style training, that's basically what it is. So just general guidelines for strength and power training. So 45 to 60 minutes. Again, you don't want to run too far with these sessions. Otherwise, your athletes will start, to, especially if you're doing it after practice, which many people do, your athletes are going to start to exhibit some sort of fatigue. Um, two to three exercises per muscle group. So again, a very general recommendation, but generally you're going to have, you know, exercises for the lower body, for the upper body. There's going to be different sort of patterns for each of those. For the upper body, you could look at pushing exercises, pulling exercises for the lower body. You could look at squatting, deadlifting, split squatting, that sort of stuff. So in general, you're going to have two to three exercises for, for both, probably you know, four to six exercises. Sets and reps are going to vary depending on whether you're, you're trying to develop you know, increase in muscle size increase in power or increase in, in strength. So in general for strength power exercises, the recovery needs to be pretty substantial um, to ensure that intensity is maintained because power and strength are very kind of intensity driven uh, things. So if the intensity drops, then you're not necessarily going to get the adaptation that you want. So you want to make sure that there's you know, adequate recovery between the sets if you, if you do these exercises. So recovery for something like that, for 24 to 72 hours again that depends on basically how much you do in the session so um, larger sessions are going to need with more volume of uh, lifts are going to need longer recovery time smaller sessions less recovery time so one one note here that I, that's good to point out is uh, heavy strength training is i think probably the most stressful one of the most stressful things on the body um, when you think about like organizing like uh, track athletics training so it's not really compatible with like high quality technical work so if you're ever implementing a uh, you know strength training into your program with your athletes that's something and that kind of comes down to the periodization and long-term planning aspects when you do that maximal strength work you're probably not putting your athletes in the best position to get a high quality technical work done or like high quality sprint work done or things that really really uh, demand uh, a high level of uh, capacity from the nervous system because strength training is a very neural activity and technical training is also a very neural, neurally driven activity. So they both kind of draw from the same pot. In general, like power, and, like, power training or explosive um, weight training is going to be a little bit more complementary to technical work and that's mostly because it lacks what we call a an eccentric phase. So they're mostly mostly done in a concentric manner. So that means basically you're not loading up your muscles quite as much. So you're not incurring quite as much muscle damage and inflammation after a power-based session compared to a heavy strength-based session. So that sort of anatomical damage from strength training really has a negative impact, negative impact on uh, technical work, whereas the power it does sap your nervous system but it doesn't really cause that anatomical damage to the same degree. So right here, I just have two sort of simple examples that I quickly threw up here. Um, so this would be, this, these, uh, these programs weren't for track and field athletes specifically, but these would be two different programs, one of which that is you know, looking more to develop uh, power, basically, so you got, and the other was more developed strength. So the first program, you see the inclusion of some Olympic lifting style things, power cleans, overhead barbell jerks, and then some uh, what I call assistance lifts. So lifts that, you know, they're not really there to develop power, but they're there to help uh, reduce injury and keep symmetry within the body and maintain some, some strength quality. So um, we'll just take a minute here too to go over the general sort of tenets of like uh, planning a, a strength session and what things you consider. So, I mean, you have the exercise selection, obviously. Then you also have the tempo there, so you can see that column. So, basically, exercises, the, the tempo can vary depending on what you're looking for. So, in this case, those X's mean that the exercise needs to be done in a very explosive manner, whereas the 301 below that, that indicates, like, the different phases of movement. So, 
the eccentric phase, the isometric phase, and the concentric phase. So basically how slow you lower the weight, how long you pause, and then how fast you come back up. So 301 for that deadlift would mean you're pulling it up in one second and then you're lowering it down in three seconds. So a pretty controlled manner. And then you can see the reps and sets over four weeks. You can see that the actual volume varies week to week. And that's a pretty important component of uh, strength training as well is that volume and intensity change usually as, as time goes along. They don't stay constant and that allows for progressive overload and recovery so that you don't run into any overtraining issues. So uh, the training program below that, that's more of a uh, program that's trying to develop just strength ability. So you got barbell back squat, a uh, rear foot elevated split squat with a barbell, some upper body stuff for upper back, wide grip pull-ups, dumbbell rows. So you'll notice that the rep range is a lot lower. Um, and again, as you saw from that chart, um, those max strength needs to be at a, uh, at a lower rep range to get that uh, adaptation. So five reps for that squat. If it was 10 reps, that'd be more of a hypertrophy based um, program. Um, and you can see the upper body stuff is also done with uh, lower reps as well. So those are just some very general sort of examples of what like a strength training program looks like just on paper. So another thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about uh, implementing some strength training for your athletes is the exercise selection. Um, so the big thing with that is the specificity of the exercise that you're choosing. So the exercise definitely doesn't have to look exactly like the competitive movement. So it, uh, you know, it doesn't have to look like, uh, you don't have to be doing high knees with like a barbell on your back or something like that. But there should be some sort of relation to the competitive movement, but that could be in a variety of different ways. So, you know, you could simply be exercising the same muscle groups that are involved in the competitive movement. So if you look at a sprinter, you know, you probably in the gym are going to give that sprinter exercises that are going to focus on the posterior chain. So things like the hamstrings and the glutes, which are used heavily in sprinting, and increasing the ability of those muscle groups to develop force, you know, can increase performance. So, you know, from a specificity standpoint, you'd probably want to focus more on that than say their biceps, which don't really come into play at all. Um, then you want to look at the coordination of muscle groups. So that comes more into when you're thinking about like power-based type exercises. So a very common sort of movement pattern you see in uh, track is, is explosive sort of hip extension. So that explosive kind of explosion concentric force from the hips that you see in like a, a jumping movement or a sprinting movement, um, that's something that you also see in something like a, a hang clean or a power clean, those Olympic lifting type movements or a kettlebell swing. So you're basically trying to somewhat recreate that uh, movement pattern but with a higher, a higher load to really focus on developing the power aspect. Um, you can also look at metabolic demands, so basically energy systems. That's not necessarily something I, I really recommend for uh, you know, track, track and field athletes, because for the most part, that can be taken care of with your uh, sports-specific training. If you're a distance runner, you're probably better served by you know, getting your metabolic training your energy, energy system done training with running rather than doing you know, weight room circuits and that sort of thing. Um, kinetic characteristics, so that would be you know forces. So again, that's uh, basically talking about strength. So you know how we're talking about like how fast you apply that force, how much force you can produce back to all that stuff. So if you have an event that like say high jump, where you have to produce a lot of force and a lot of force quickly, well then specificity, you'd start looking at things like maximum strength and uh, power development and that sort of thing. So that's somewhat specific to high jump, even though it's not the same thing. Then the last one would be kinematic characteristics, which is more looking at angles, duration, 
in support phases, rate of change and range of motion, that sort of thing. So, you know, you can you can kind of create exercises that kind of mimic the range of motion that you see in the uh, competitive event as well. So no exercise has to enca encapsulate all of these different things, but if you're giving an athlete an exercise, you know, this stuff should be, at least one of these things should be considered in order for there to be some sort of transfer to the competitive activity that you're trying to see a increase in performance in. So we're gonna move into talking a little bit about uh, just some basics about periodization. So periodization is basically just, it's basically just planning. So planning your, uh, your season out kind of ahead of time, planning the training out to make sure that it all kind of occurs in a kind of cohesive manner. Um, pretty, uh, it's, kind of, it's, it's a pretty confusing topic if you, if you read about it. So we're gonna to try to keep it like pretty, pretty simple. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, training residuals and reversibility. So when you train qualities, it takes a certain amount of time to, you know, train them to see an improvement. And, it all, and if you stop training them and just stop doing workouts, you'll, it also takes a certain amount of time for them to detrain and disappear. And that differs depending on the quality. So for maximal strength training, say if you, you know, you took an athlete through a four-week chunk of strength training you saw an improvement to their uh, you know the max you know their maximum ability to say back squat and they improve their squat by 50 pounds or something like that 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 will stick around for a relatively long period of time but it will slowly diminish but not until you know again this is an approximate estimate but about 30 days so that capacity once trained sticks around for a long period of time similar for the aerobic system as well and that's where you kind of get these terms like building a strength base early in the season, in the preseason, or building that aerobic base early in the preseason. Because these two things don't necessarily, you know, have a huge, huge influence on the competitive event itself, but they're going to enhance the ability for you to train, um, enhance the workouts that you're going to do that will make you better at the competitive event. And they last for a long period of time, so you can afford to do them early and not as much later on in the season. Um, whereas things like, you know, maximal speed, you can see the residuals only five days, so very explosive movements. You'll see a relatively quick change, and that's mostly because it's a neural adaptation. But then if you stop doing it, you'll see a relatively quick decrease. So these are the kind of things that, you know, you definitely want to make sure you develop as you get later into the season because you can't really stop doing them ever, and you want to make sure that they're, you know, have a high level of competency of those things if they're specific to the event. So, you know, a sprinter needs to sprint if he's going to prepare for, for sprinting sort of thing. If he doesn't sprint at all, or if he sprints a lot early in the season, he stops, he won't maintain that at all after, you know, five or three days, it'll start to decrease a lot. So training residuals are a good thing to keep in mind. It's a good chart to, to reference. Um, so once you develop some of these qualities, you can easily maintain them throughout the season without having to spend a ton of time on them again if you've done a really good job of working at them earlier in the season. Um, periodization models uh, is a very expansive talk topic. Um, lots of history of that in track and field. So there's lots and lots of different periodization models and this could be a whole separate presentation itself, but I just kind of boiled it down to, uh, you know, two very common ways that, you know, people structure their, their training. So um, you kind of look at the co-current method and the sequential method. So with concurrent training, so this is basically what beginners can do. Um, since untrained athletes, you know, they pretty much get better when you throw almost anything at them. So the planning doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, super stringent or super detailed. Um, you, you can work on multiple physical physical qualities at the same time. So you can work on strength, you can work on power, you can work on, you know, building a little muscle, you can work on explosiveness, you can work on all those things at once. You could have all those workouts, you know, in the same week. At that stage, it doesn't really matter a whole lot. They're going to adapt to those workouts um, regardless of what, what you plan because um, they're, again, at that untrained level. So there's not really like a huge particular emphasis for like a chunk of training. You just kind of have this broad sort of development. 
And it's good for younger athletes too because it's a lot less monotonous. So athletes that are a little less mature like psychologically tend to handle that type of periodization quite a bit better than something that's super focused on one thing and is more repetitive in nature. Um, whereas sequential periodization, that's kind of what you need to move towards, something a model similar to that as the athlete becomes more advanced. So eventually, you know, the athlete won't improve if you try to develop you know, a bunch of qualities all at once, and you have to really zero in on something that you know, the athlete really needs to improve performance, and it's going to take a lot of work to create a change in that quality. So what you need is lar a large concentrated stimulus at a certain point to achieve a you know, further adaptation. So sequential periodization focuses on narrow groupings of complementary physical qualities while trying to maintain the other qualities that have been developed, you know, earlier in the season. So that would be something like you know, early in the season you focus on strength training, you develop a base of strength, and then that for say for the next four to four to eight weeks after that, you focus on you know, power based training, you don't do any strength training at all. Um, and then you go into a maintenance phase, try to you know put a session there to build a little bit of that strength back, but you're kind of switching focuses sort of block to block and from time period to time period. So you need to do that at a certain point as the athlete starts to get to a higher higher level. This type of training also takes into account training residuals that we talked about earlier. So it kind of uses those concepts and structures training so that you know the qualities are being developed in a, in a manner where you can kind of maintain everything but still apply large concentrated doses of the training needed to stimulate you know, further gains. So an example of that is block periodization which I put there below. Um, so basically with block periodization they boil it up, up into three separate phases accumulation, transmutation, realization. So this is a common periodization scheme you see in track. So Accumulation would be really working on general qualities that have long residuals at a high high volume for a fairly long period of time early in the season. And then moving to transmutation, which is more high intensity sports specific type things with shorter residuals for a slightly lesser period of time early in the season. And then after that, moving into realization, which is either resting or tapering or doing some sort of time trial testing or competition. And what happens is this, these kind of three chunks are repeated over and over again. And as you move kind of closer to the season, the accumulation phase decreases, the transmutation phase, the sports specific stuff increases um, to kind of reflect that increasing competitive fitness leading into the, the competitive phase. So that's just one of many different type of periodization models out there. But you should understand that there's, you know, lots to read and lots to learn about that stuff as far as planning out training in in the long term for for the whole year for athletes that are at that level and require that type of planning um, some common themes with periodization basically no matter what sort of model you're uh, following is they should include some sort of uh, wave like loading pattern so the loading on the athletes so the sets the reps the intensity even even with you know technical based training or sprint based training or you know the amount of kilometers you run in a week um, the amount of lifting sessions again all that stuff should never stay constants year round so if you do that then you'll definitely run into some overtraining injury problems so most training programs you'll well good training programs you'll see a, a wave like loading pattern in uh, the workouts that are assigned so that's kind of what you see in the picture on the left there so you just see the relatively the relative weekly loading so it kind of kind of goes up and down as the uh, the weeks progress so what that does it allows for you know adequate recovery um, for the athletes so they're not their body isn't constantly hit by the same stress for too long a period of time and it also allows for progressive overload so that the stimulus um, in a given training cycle keeps increasing week after week to kind of spur and increased adapt so spur adaptation um, it's also important for training and competition so you want to decrease that load like ride that wave down as you head into a competition to ensure that you know there's no residual fatigue from training that's going to mask the fitness that they've developed 
Another piece is variation in exercise selection. So that is really important for avoiding overuse injuries. So if you, you know, say you're, you get, you're started doing strength training with your athletes and uh, you use the same like weight training exercise year round and you just vary the, say the, you know, the sets and reps, that sort of thing, might not be the best idea because when you do the same movement over and over and over again, you tend to put yourself at risk for overuse injuries. It's not something you can avoid in the competitive event, but in the weight room, it's very easy to avoid because there's lots and lots of different varieties of exercises that you can do. So varying the exercise selection cycle to cycle is also a pretty important aspect of well put together resistance training programs. It also ensures you know, continued adaptation. Um, the body and the nervous system re really like you know, novel training stresses. So you really have to make sure that you're always doing something a little bit different to get the nervous system to continually adapt to exercise. And then there's, a, there's also an increasing emphasis on specificity of training as the training program progresses into the competitive season. And that's simply to you know, ensure competitive fitness and ensure that you know, you're able to get high quality technical work done before you enter the competitive phase so that you're able to you know, be technically proficient when you, when you start your season. So that kind of sums up the, uh, sums up the presentation. So I just wanted, I just touched upon like a lot of, uh, a lot of different topics. So it was by no means meant to be uh, completely, uh, to cover completely everything, but hopefully gives you an idea of, um, you know, some things to look into and to do some more reading and, and uh, learning about. So if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, if you have a mic, you can turn your mic on or you can shoot me you know, out in the, the chat box. So best resources for specific exercises. So yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of resources on the uh, internet, but I think one of the one of the better websites out there, if you're looking at you know if you want to find like good reading material, um, is uh, and has all the kind of exercises on. I think it's exrx. Dot, dot com. I could be wrong. It's something similar to that, but anyway, it's a pretty old school website. Um, it's pretty old, but it's got uh, it's got a lot of good information on there, and it, lots of people lots of people use it. Um, and you can kind of see all the basic sort of um, things you need to consider for. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, I think that's gone. I think that's it. Um, yeah, so that would be a that would be a good website to maybe check out. So I mean, it gives you like all the different sort of movements, the technique, you know, the muscles they kind of target. Lots of lots of good good information on there. Maybe John can post the uh, the link there. Yeah, so like I said, it's a pretty, uh, I think you can all see that. It's a pretty old school website, but, uh, you know, there's lots of uh, good resources on here about, uh, about strength training. Lots of things you can, you can look at. So if you wanted to learn about, you know, all the different kind of muscles, and you know, they've got them all listed here, you know, they're, what they do, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you want to learn about you know, specific exercises, they have an exercise uh, library on here. So, uh, if you want to learn about Olympic lifting, it's got all that stuff on there. It's got sort of progressions. It's probably not the best organized website, but as far as free content goes, it's probably one of the better ones on the uh, on the internet.